Hello everybody, welcome to another reviews video tutorial. My name is Juan and today I'm going to be talking about co-integration using the Engel and Granger method. So for the topic outline, I'm going to split this video into two. First, I'm going to be talking about co-integration in this first video using the Engel and Granger co-integration test. And on the second video, I'm going to be talking about the error correction model. So I have split this video into two because it was very long otherwise if I try to keep all the information in one video. But I do recommend you to watch two videos because it's a topic that a lot of people has asked me about. I've got many emails asking to teach co-integration um, and the error correction model. So that's why I'm taking the time now to cover these topics. So I hope you find it useful. So let's begin with a co-integration overview. In univariate models, we have seen that a stochastic trend can be removed applying first differences, and then the stationary series can be estimated and forecasted using the vox jenkins three steps method. However, treating non-stationary variables in multivariate models is not that straightforward. And the reason for that is because there can be a linear combination of integrated variables that is stationary. So in such case, we say that the variables are co-integrated. They are gonna hold a long-run relationship. So when we are talking about co-integration, always comes this dilemma of whether we are dealing with a spurious regression or we are in the presence of some variables that are, are co-integrated. So if the link between the variables is not stationary, we are in the presence of a spurious regression. An example is that the residuals would be non-stationary. So spurious regressions are those between variables with a similar trend but don't have an economic sense. It can have a statistic significance, but it has no economic interpretation. So just for you to keep in mind, all of the economic variables in general do have a trend. So of course, if you regress those variables, you're gonna find that, yeah, both have a similar trend, but that doesn't mean that they, they will have an economic interpretation with, with each other. So this is a paper that I included in the description of the video by Newell and Granger which is called um, just a spurious regression in econometrics. And they mention in their paper that some of the signs for spurious regression are they have a very high R square, like 99, but they have a very low Durbin Watson statistic. And just as a rule of thumb, if the R square is bigger than the Durbin Watson statistic, that is already a sign that you know you are in the presence of a potentially spurious regression. Also, that these statistics are very high. Yes, the variables are highly significant. And finally, the residuals are not stationary because in the case that they were, there would be co-integration, okay? But if we have higher square, low Durbin Watson, that these statistics are very high. And then when we check for the co-integration test and we find that these residuals are not stationary, then we are saying, okay, this is a spurious regression. It doesn't have any economic interpretation. So non-stationary variables can have a stationary linear combination, which is a long-run equilibrium, and that's what we are going to be talking about today. So let's see an example, which is the money-demand model. This is a classic example in the literature. Um, and basically, the classic money market hypothesis states that the market is in equilibrium and clears. Being in equilibrium and clearing means that the money demand is going to be equal to the money supply, okay? So in here, I have the formal representation for the money demand. And it's going to, as you can see, this is the money demand, which is going to depend here on a constant. This is the price level. This is the real income. And this is the interest rate, OK? Uh, finally, we have here a stationary disturbance term. This error has to be stationary. And that's what we are going to, going to be talking a little bit about now. Finally, these betas, okay, all these beta one, beta zero, sorry, beta one, beta two, beta three, these are the terms that need to be estimated. And then from classic theory, once we estimate these models, what we should find is that beta one is positive because when the prices increase, your demand for money is gonna increase. Then we have to find that beta two is positive as well because when your real income increases, then your demand for money is going to increase as well. And finally, beta 3, yes, if we were to estimate this model, we should find that it's negative. This is when interest rates go up, the demand for money is going to go down because the price of money is more expensive. Let's see some considerations for the money demand model. 
Here we have again the model written. And some of the considerations would be that if the economic theory is valid, deviations in the demand for money must be temporary. Okay, that is very important. Why? Because if the error term has a stochastic trend, this means that if the error term is non-stationary, the errors would accumulate and the market never clears. The deviations in the demand for money would be permanent and not transitory. Okay, so if this is uh, non-stationary, okay, what we are going to see is that there is a shock, okay, the, it will never return, okay, the, look, it doesn't have an equilibrium, okay, in the long run it's going to be increasing non-stop, okay, but if this error term is stationary, there's going to be a deviation, but then it comes back, there's going to be some, some strength, something that is going to make, uh, you know, this value go down again, right? So this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a disequilibrium, okay, but always come back, okay? So that's what it means that the error is stationary. If it's not stationary, we're not going to see an equilibrium. But if it's stationary, then there's going to be, for example, increases the demand for money, but then uh, there's more supply and it go goes down. Or for example, the interest rate goes up and then the demand goes down, right? So just... Uh, as a note, the problem is that most economic variables are integrated of order one. They are not stationary in levels. So if all the variables are not stationary in levels, how can this model be in equilibrium? If this is not stationary, not stationary, not stationary, not stationary, okay, how can this be stationary then, right? How all this model will be in equilibrium? So the answer is that there's going to be a linear combination of these um, non-stationary variables that will be stationary. So if we can see, okay, and we solve for the error term, okay, we're gonna get to this expression here. And this error term now, this linear combination of all these terms is going to be stationary. Okay, so that's what we are doing here with co-integration. We are working with non-stationary variables and levels, but there's going to be a linear combination of them that it's going to make these residuals stationary. We have talked already about what is co-integration, what we require for these models to have an equilibrium. Okay, so let's see how we can identify the uh, if two variables are co-integrated. So in order to do so, we are going to use the Engel and Granger two steps method. In the step number one, we are going to test the variables for their order of integration. Okay, so as a note, all the variables have to be of the same integration order. So if you have one of your variables is, for example, stationary in first differences, but the other one is stationary in second differences. They have a different order of integration, okay? So that's that's not valid, okay? So then we have to estimate the long-run equilibrium model by OLS. We need to save the residuals, and then we have to test if the residuals are stationary, okay? So this is what we're going to do then. We're going to estimate the model by OLS, and we're going to save the residuals. If the variables are co-integrated, the OLS estimates will yield super consistent parameters, beta 0 and beta 1, as they converge faster than they do using stationary variables. So if you would like to read a little bit more about this, there's this paper by Watson in 1987 that describes, uh, describes this phenomenon, okay? So following next, the aumented Dickey-Filler statistics are not valid for the residuals in the root test. Okay, so we estimate the model, we're going to save the residuals, and we're going to conduct the unit root test. However, when we conduct this test, the, the, the aumented Dickey Fuller statistics are not valid. And why? Well, the residuals are not observable. There are two outcomes. We can use the residual regression test table. Okay, there's going to be a co-integration statistics table that we will need to use. Or we can proceed with the Engel and Granger co-integration test or the phillips uliaris test. Both of these tests are available in views, and we are going to be covering them as well, okay? And in step number two, then, once we have determined that these variables are co-integrated, we're going to estimate the error correction model, which is the short-run model, and we're going to do some model diagnostics. For today, I have an example. It's called, I put it trade, because we're going to be looking at the exports and imports for Canada during the years 1961 and 2005, quarter four, and here I wrote method one. The reason because I wrote method one is because in this case, we're going to be using the regression test tables, okay? We're going to be using the co-integration um, statistics table, 
and then I'm going to show you method two, which is um, which is basically doing the angle and ratio cointegration tests. So the reason why I wanted to do both methods is because I know there are some videos out there where they are just doing the augmented Dickey filler test on the residuals and using those statistics, but that is not valid because, as I mentioned before, you cannot use those statistics for a regression of a, a series that comes out of a regression. Okay, so what are we going to do then with these variables? The step number one will be checking for stationarity. Both variables have to be integrated of the same order. And for doing that, we're going to check at the graph, correlogram, and formal tests. In views, I have here my variables x for exports, m for imports, and the sample goes from the year 1961 to 2005, and it's quarterly data. So the first thing that I would like to do is open these variables together. I'm going to open exports um, and imports together. And we're going to take a look at this graph, open as a group, and then we're going to click view as a graph. And we can see that these two variables are very closely aligned. Okay, This is what we can see in this graph. They are very closely aligned. So this can be already it's telling us that this, these two variables are moving together. We can have already some insights that these variables could have a long run relationship. And the reason for that, I'll picture this. If countries general try to target you know, a stable trade balance, so if imports increase too much, then countries will try to export more Okay, to have a stable trade balance. Um, so that's the reason why uh, you know, there can be a deviation, there can be a moment where imports increase, but then they should decrease, right? Uh, because that's the same that if you have a credit card and you start spending a lot of money, in one moment you will need to cut okay, your expenses. The first thing I would like to do is to convert these variables into logs. The reason for that is you, you saw in the graph that it was in, it was in billion dollars and the estimates of our linear regression are not going to be so easy to interpret. Uh, but if we take a look into the elasticities and we analyze in percentage terms, this is going to make much more sense for us. So I click in generate here and then opens this window and I'm going to type, for example, LM. And that's going to mean that's going to be the new name for my variable equal. And now I type log M. So here, if, if use has generated my variable in logs, I'm going to do the same now, but for export. So I call it LX. And then I type log x. And here we have now our two variables, log x and log m. We can open and view the graph. And we can see that still the, the imports do have a positive trend. This can be a, you know, a signal that this variable is non-stationary, has a positive trend. So we're going to now take a look at the correlogram in levels. And you can see that the correlogram is decaying in a very slow pattern. Okay, you see here it's going very slow, the autocorrelation. So this is a sign that this variable is non-stationary as well. So finally, we're just going to complement this analysis with the unit roots test, standard unit root test, and I'm going to hit the augmented Dickey filler. Here the new hypothesis, as we know already, is that um, my series has a unit root, okay, and because this value is bigger than 0 0.05, okay, and we are using the 5% significance level, we cannot reject this hypothesis. My, my variable does have a unit root and it's non stationary, okay. The next thing that I would like to do then is to conduct the test again, but in first differences to check if in first differences my variable is now stationary. So I hit OK in first differences. And now you see that we are rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, so we confirm that this series is integrated of order one. Now let's move into LX and do the same exercise. Okay, we're going to see the graph quickly. Uh, I'll do this quickly so we don't spend too much time. Here we go. We see that it has a positive trend. We're going to complement this with a correlogram. We check it in levels, and you can see that also decays the autocorrelation in a very low, slow pattern. That's a sign of my variable is non-stationary. So we're going to complement this with a standard unit root test, augmented Dickey filler in levels, okay? And we can see that this value is bigger than 0 0.05, OK? 
Okay, so I cannot reject my null hypothesis that my variable has a unit root, so it's non-stationary. But let's check if in first differences then, standard unit root test, I click first differences now, and let's check if now my variable is stationary. And we can see that the p-value um, now is significant. It's, uh, it's smaller than 0 0.05, so I reject this hypothesis. My series is integrated of order 1 as well. We have confirmed that both variables are non-stationary, but they are integrated of order 1. This means that in first differences, they are stationary. And the good thing is that both variables are integrated of the same order. So we can go ahead, OK? Remember that they had to be integrated of the same order. And we confirm that both are stationary in, in first differences. So what are we going to do after checking stationarity? Well, we're going to estimate the long run model. OK, so I'm going to be estimating exports and adding a constant and uh, imports as the independent variable. And then we're going to save the residuals. And we're going to perform the augmented decay filler test on those residuals. OK, so let's go then back to views and let's complete this part. In views, I'm going to hit here in quick estimate equation. And here I'm going to type then LX because we're using, remember, our variables in logs. Then I'm going to use the constant and then I'm going to include LM, the imports. So, sorry, let me put a space here. So now we can hit OK. And here we have our model. OK, so here our model is telling a couple of things. The constant, uh, you can see that seems to be significant. The, the imports are significant. And the way you have to understand this coefficient is that a 1% increase in the imports is going to increase 1.02% the export. So this is, a, this is what it's called the long run regression. And we can see that in the long run, yes, the, the exports increase just slightly more than the imports. So that's, that's good. We have a positive trade balance. Uh, but let's let's remember what Newell and Granger said. Yes, that they have the R square is is very high, and the Durbin Watson is smaller, okay, than the R square. So this could potentially be okay as spurious regression. Furthermore, if we check at the T statistics, look at this: it's 324. That's extremely significant. As a rule of thumb, this T statistic should be somewhere around two. Um, three, I don't know, wouldn't be 324, okay? So these are signs, okay, that my series, okay, this regression is spurious. However, we need to check, yes, if the residuals are stationary or not. If my residuals are not stationary, then we confirm that this is a spurious regression. But if my residuals are stationary, then we would confirm that my variables are co-integrated and have a long run relationship, okay? So that's what we're going to do now. So how do we do that? Okay, we're going to click in proc and we're going to make residual series, okay? So here I'm going to call it the name of my residuals. I'll call it residuals and LT means long term, okay? So that's what I'm just calling. You can call it however you wish. And here then if use, okay, has has provided our residual series. And what we can do now is conduct the unit root test. So I'm going to hit unit root. And I'm going to hit here standard unit root. And it's very important that you put in levels and no trend or intercept. The reason for that is um, this, this, the residual shouldn't have, OK? They shouldn't have a trend. So we're going to hit OK now. And this is very interesting because Remember that the null hypothesis is that the residuals have a unit root. And because this value is smaller than 0 0.05, OK, check that it's 0, 0, 0, 0.007, OK? So with these values, we would be confirming that my residuals are stationary, OK? However, recall that I told you that we cannot use these, these statistics, OK? These values are not valid, OK? So I cannot relay on these results, OK? I can use the t statistic. Yes, this is valid. But the p-value is not valid, OK? We cannot use these values, OK? So what are we going to do? We're going to copy this value, and we're going to be using the co-integration tables. Back to the slides, we have estimated the long-run model, 
we have performed the augmented dicky filler test and now we are in this last step okay if if the residuals are uh, stationary the variables are going to be integrated and we have mentioned already that we cannot use the augmented decay filler test statistics that we had there in those results. We need to use the table values. So I'm going to move into the next slide. This is the regression residuals test table. I have included a link in the description so you can get access to this table. And I'm going to teach you how to use it. So basically here the first column is telling us how many variables we have in our model. We have two variables. It's asking us what is the sample size. Okay, so we are very close to 200, so I'm going to be relying on these critical values, okay? And these values, of course, this is a 10% critical value, 5% critical value, and 1% critical value, okay? So if we went back to views, you can see that these t statistics are different, okay? Look, these t statistics are all different, okay? The only thing that you're going to be taking from this test is going to be the st this statistic. This is valid, but this is not valid, and this is not valid, okay? So just copy this number, negative 343, and let's go back to the tables so we can analyze the results. I have included here a nice graph where we can see in an easier way whether or not my series has a unit root. So recall the null hypothesis is that my series has a unit root. So if we lay in this area, then my series would be non-stationary. These values are the 10% and the 5% critical values. Okay, again, this is the 10% and the 5%. And we can see that negative 343 falls in the, in the rejection area. Consequently, my series is a stationary. We reject that it has a unit root. So having performed this test, we can conclude that my variables are co-integrated as the residuals are stationary. As you have seen, using the tables is a bit more time consuming. So now let's move into this trade, uh, into this method, method two, which is just an easier method, it's more straightforward, and it's using the co-integration tests that are provided by views. So we're going to estimate the equation then using the co-integration option. I'm gonna teach you how to do that. And then we're going to conduct two tests, the Engel and Granger and the phillips uliaris co-integration tests. So some observations about this. Both tests are residual best tests for co-integration. These tests are simply unit root tests applied to the series residuals. The null hypothesis is that the series are not co-integrated. Therefore, rejecting the null hypothesis will result in our series being co-integrated. Engel and Granger and Phillips Hilaris test differ on the method for accounting for serial correlation in the residual series. Engel and Granger test uses a parametric augmented decay filler approach, while Philips Hilaris uses a non-parametric Philips Perron approach. Okay, so that's basically the difference. Both tests are going to tell us whether or not our variables are co-integrated. The only difference is that the Engel and Granger relies on the augmented decay filler approach and Philips Hilaris relies on the Philips Perron approach. So now let's get into eViews and let's finish then with um, this method. In eViews, to perform the co-integration test, what we will need to do is go into quick estimate equation and we are going to type LX, C, LM. Recall that LX is the logs of the exports, LM is the logs of the imports. And here in method, we're going to be changing from least square to co-integration regression, okay? In here, we're going to leave all the all the options as default. We are, don't want to change anything in here, and we're going to hit OK. As you can see, the results do not differ, OK? So if you recall from before, the coefficient for the imports was 1.02, so that it's all going to be the same. The only difference that there's going to be is that now we use will allow us to go into view, and it's going to provide us with this option, co-integration tests. So we're going to hit into these co-integration tests and it's going to provide us what criteria we want to use to test for co-integration. And as I mentioned, we're going to be using two, Engel and Granger and then Philips Uliaris. Let's hit then into Engel and Granger. We're going to leave the Schwartz information criterion um, to determine the lags. So we hit OK. OK, and here 
the analysis that we need to do is the following. Recall that the null hypothesis is that my series are not co-integrated. So a p-value smaller than 0 0.05 okay, confirms at the 5% that my series are co-integrated. And we can see that the values okay, are smaller than 0 0.05. So we are confirming with the Engelang-Granger method then that my series are co-integrated. Recall that when we use the tables, um, the tables were the same, give, give us the same result, okay? And if you look at it, it's using the, the t star easy that I mentioned. That's fair to use, the negative 343, but what you cannot use is the, the t statistics from, from the 1, 5, and 10% critical uh, levels. So now let's move into doing the last test that is going to be the Phillips Ciliaris. So I'm going to click in co-integration tests. And we're going to select Philips Ulieris. As you can see, because this is non-parametric, it's not going to ask us how many lags. Recall that the Philips per run test doesn't ask us for lags in the um, in the unit root test. Um, so that's basically the difference with the um, Engel and Granger method. We're going to hit OK. And here we have the results. The null hypothesis is the same that the Engel and Granger. The series are not co-integrated. However, we can see that these values are smaller than 0 0.05, so we are rejecting, okay? We reject the null hypothesis that the series are not co-integrated. So in conclusion, exports and imports in Canada over the period 1961 and 2005 are co-integrated. We have determined this both by using first the table that recall, you don't need to do, use that method. I just wanted to clarify that if you are going to just relay on the augmented decay filler test, you don't have to use the T statistics provided by the ADF test, okay? And you have to go and compare with the tables. And the method two, which is the method that I recommend, is estimating the co-integration regression and then going in options in the views and performing the Engel and Granger and the Philips Juliaris test. So this was all for today. I hope it helped you clarify and understand a little bit more when two variables are co-integrated. And I would like to invite you to subscribe to my channel to get access to more videos. Recall that I'm going to be submitting shortly the error correction model. And then I'm going to be teaching Garch models and many other type of models. So it's, if you would like to get access to these videos, so I would like you to, to subscribe so you stay tuned to the channel and finally there's a link in the description where I have included where you can buy for a very small price the slides with the all the results the test we, you're getting the eviews work file complete with all the instructions and explanations step by step so thank you very much for watching and have a nice day Thank you.